Father, we thank you, Lord, for the freedom we have in Christ. Lord, that freedom didn't come free. You had to pay a price. Lord, a price that we will never, ever have to experience or go through. So we thank you, Lord, first and foremost, for the freedom that we have through you, Lord. Father, we ask for a triple portion of your spirit, Father, fresh upon your service. Father, we, we know that you created the heavens and the earth, that you hold the universe in your hands. And so we come before you, our awesome and mighty God. And we pray that today, Lord, our hearts would be open to receive your word, that we would grow in our walks, to become more like you every day. So we ask even now, Lord, that you would pull the weeds of our lives, of our sins, Lord, and that you would be magnified in this place today. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray all God's children said, amen, amen. amen. Good morning. Good morning. How are you guys doing? How? First Timothy chapter 3. The Bible says in verse 14, these things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly, but if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in glory. Amen. And so as we come to the close of chapter 3, we come to the very heart of this letter that Paul wrote to Timothy. As we look at these verses, we're dead center in the epistle. The first three chapters have given Timothy some positive instruction, and the last three chapters give negative warning. And here we have the very purpose of this letter, the reason for Paul's concern. He is writing to instruct on how believers are to act, are to conduct themselves within the church. And you probably heard of that of the great coach, Vince Lombardi. For all you football guru, gurus out there, the Hall of Fame coach of the Green Bay Packers football team, he majored in the fundamentals. And once after a, a, a very big game, he stood in the locker room, he held up the football, and he said, gentlemen, for all you football gurus, you should know this, right? This is a football. A football. You think they knew it was a football? I'm sure they did. They, they probably didn't play like it. It was a football, right? They probably, and so what did he mean? Again, he was reminding them of the fundamentals. Let's hold up our Bible. Amen. Say it together. This is a Bible. Amen. You see, we need to be reminded of the fundamentals. We need to, to be reminded why we're here. And as we look at these verses today, they will tell us. Let's go ahead and look at verse 14 and see what it says here. It says, these things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly. So the first part of this verse, we see these things I write to you. He could be referring to the things that he just written about the church leadership as we looked at the last couple of the weeks, whether it be the role of a pastor, the, of the requirements, the role of a deacon, or he could be referring to the entire epistle, the whole letter, but it seems likely to hear that Paul is speaking of the entire purpose of his letter, and he is giving his reason for writing this letter. Since it appears that Paul wasn't able to come as soon as he originally had hoped, as he says, though I hope to come to you shortly, he wrote this letter to what? To encourage, to strengthen Timothy in leading the church. Again, Timothy was a young man. He was a young man put in a, in a difficult situation. He didn't, he didn't want to be there. He was a little discouraged. And so Paul wrote this letter to encourage him because Timothy had a great task in putting that church back in order. 
See, this passage not only gives the reason for the letter, but it also gives the theological basis for it as well. Its basic message is that order, can we say order? Order. order. Is necessary for the church. Amen. Precisely because of what the church is. You see, God brought order to the universe. Amen? Amen. It's amazing for all you gurus that like to get your telescopes out, look at the different stars, and, and you have, uh, for some of you teenagers, when you're younger, you have you know, the globe, and then you have all the solar, you know, the, the solar system and all the little, and how it all just what works together, like a clock, huh? You see, in Genesis chapter 1, and we're going to be going through a lot of different verses, so I would definitely encourage you to write them down um, if you can't get to them. But we're going to be looking at at least 15 references today. So we're going to be kind of going around and, and getting to know our Bible a little bit. But in Genesis chapter 1, guess what chapter that's in? The first chapter of the Bible. <laughs> chapter 1. We see here, he says, the very first verse, right? In the beginning, God created what? The heavens and the earth. The earth was without form. Did you know that? And not only that, it was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the water. I love this because we see here God brought order to the universe. We find that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It tells us here in verse 2 that the earth was formless and void. And in the original context, the term formless and void were meant to convey the idea of confusion and disorder. And God brought what? God got order to the universe. God created the earth. Why did he create the earth? To be inhabited. Inhabited by who? Well, by us. By, by everything he created. But for a brief time before he created plants, animals, man, light, all those things and so forth, the earth was again, what? Void. It was void. And we need to see that. It was void of everything. Now, could you imagine if God just left things the way they were? In Genesis chapter 1 and 2, there would be no life. The earth would still be Void. And yet the psalmist says in Psalms 8, 3, and 4, chapter 8, verse 3 and 4, it says, When I considered your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him? And the son of man that you visit him. It's amazing how when you think about really, I mean, we can go into depth in this, but we don't have time. But when you think about how, how small we are, and yet that God would consider us, that God would send His only begotten Son to die for us, that God has time for us, God has time for you, every single one of us. I love that. You see, the universe is set up in an orderly manner. That's what, we, what I want you to see. The universe is set up in an orderly manner. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33. Got that verse up? There it is. What does it say? For God is not what? The author of confusion, but of peace. And in all, all the churches of the saints. And as you go down to, to the same chapter, verse 40. But let all things be done, how? Decently and in order. Paul is talking to the church about how they were misusing the spiritual gifts here in these contexts, Corinthians, that they had received. You see, the reality is, brothers and sisters, when God is the center of the church, there is peace. Can we say peace? peace. And order within the church. When our personal agendas overtake God's agendas, the church will be in turmoil. What do you mean? Well, we want to do it our way. 
when we can't see something the way it may be, we want to do it our way. I, I can't stand the paint of this room. You know, it needs to be a different color. And that picture, every time I walk in, it just gets on my nerves. It needs to be hung over here. And we need to do this, and we need to do that. And every time we walk in, every week we walk in, we, we walk in with our pencils and our paper, and, and we, we just start writing down the list of, of everything that's wrong with the church. Instead of coming and worshiping God, instead of coming and, and saying, you know what, Lord, I want to be fed spiritually. We become a detective for the Lord. When our personal agendas overtake God's agendas, the church is, will be in turmoil. If our focus is not on God and His mission, we will fight. Do you know that? We will. Why? Because we naturally do. How do you know? Well, you all live in homes. You love, your, you love your spouses. You love your kids. Do you fight? But you'll die for them too. Amen? It happens. Why? By nature. It happens when you move into relatives' houses. And, but that's your brother, and you're going to stay there in the room and rent the room and pay them rent. But the reality is, because you, you're just in that home, things are going to happen, right? But we will fight of silly things, very, very silly, while people yet are dying and going to hell. Why? Because we're worried about what's going on in these four walls rather than worrying about what God would have us to worry about in the world. And we'll spend our time, wasting our time on really things that, and give our energies to things that God's going to already take care of. God already has a plan. But see, what we're doing is we're trying to, we're trying to steer God into our direction rather than let God steer us in His direction. We're trying to tell God, this is how it has to be done. And God's saying, you need to just be still and let me be God. We need to be very, very careful. We will not care as long as we, you know, we get to do our way. When we put God in the center of the church, God will bring order. Can we say order? order. And God will bring peace. peace. Amen? To the church. And he will reap his blessings upon it. Why? Because it's his church. Do I need to protect God's church? God can protect himself. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Believe me, we get some lightnings flying down from heaven real quick. God's church is his chosen instrument. Do you understand that? We are an instrument. We're God's church. His chosen instrument to do what? To do. To proclaim the saving truth of Jesus Christ. That's our, that's our goal. By this isn't a showstopper, but this isn't a showstopper. Because the reality is when I think about on the other hand, you can become so organized that you can organize the Holy Spirit right out of the church. Organize the Holy Spirit right out of the church. We got to be very, very careful. We got to be very, very careful. Always giving room for the Lord to move. Always giving room. Always checking in with God. And never saying, you know what, Lord, this is how we're going to do it. No, you, you say, Lord, how do you want it done? Father, we're finishing up a year of ministry. I know you have a new year ahead of us. If, if it's your will, you don't come. What, what is your will for next year? And you may see different things take place. You may see ministries established. You may see, you know, people serving and not serving. Why? Because you ask God and God will tell me who or what and what he wants to do. And guess what I have to do? I have to do what God asks me to do. Whether it's bring in or take down, whatever he wants to do. Why? Because it's God who raises and God who brings down. And we need to be very careful that we don't organize the Holy Spirit out of the church. And what do you mean by that? Well, you can see a great example of this in Galatians chapter 3. You see, I like to be balanced. I love to be organized. Don't get me wrong. Do we have room for improvement in that area? Yes, we do. Will we get more organized as a church? I, I, I know we will. I know we will. But I also like having a little bit of mess and, and letting the Lord do what he wants to do. You know, the Galatians had this problem. And, he, and, and this is what the Lord said in Galatians chapter 3. Oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you 
that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified. This only I want to learn from you. Did you not receive the spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish having begun in the spirit? Are you now being made perfect by the flesh? And I want to encourage you because the church here, even as we're thinking about God is God of order, God, you know, he, he is. But he's also he that begins a good work in you is what? Faithful to complete it. We're all, there's all a little disorder in all of us. And guess what? God is putting his in order every day. And I love that. And I love that because here when we think about this church of Ephesus, it wasn't in order. It was by far in order. That's why Timothy was there. What's to help put it in order. It was by far being a perfect church. I mean, we had a perfect church until you walked in. <laughs> until we all locked the door this morning. Clearly, and this encourages me, because as we shoot for perfection, achieve excellence, we see here the, the condition of this church is, is a disarray, it's a dysfunction, there's disorder, there's disunity, and yet Timothy here, the leader of this church, don't really want to be there. Paul's encouraging them, Paul's charging him to stay there. And yet he didn't have the confidence necessary to confront the things that he was dealing with. There were false teachers within the church. It was uh, far from a place that it should have been, and yet it still was God's church. Amen? Amen. It, it, was, it was his church. And so here, Paul presents three pictures of the church. And you may be asking, so what is the church? What is our role? What is our responsibility? Three things I want us to see through this text about what the church is. Let's look at the first one here. And we go back, as we go back to 1 Timothy chapter 3, focusing, focusing now on verse 15, it says, But if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to do what? How you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God. The first thing I want us to see here is that the church is, the church of God is family. The church of God is family. If you're Hispanic, the church of God is what? Familia, right? 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, we see here, it, it says, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in, the last part of that is what? The house of God. As being a house. He refers to it as being a house. God's house is translated by some, including King James, as being a house, or as referring to a building. That is possible, especially in the light of what Paul is about to say about the church being a pillar. But, again, I don't think that's what he's talking about. I think Paul is, is getting at the fact that the church is God's family. God's family. Each congregation is a part of the church of the living God. We, every single one of us, we are members of God's household and must conduct ourselves accordingly. And we see some great examples of that in Galatians chapter 6, verse 10, the Bible says, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do what? Do good to all. All y'all. Every single one. Especially to those who are in the household of faith. We see that word again. In the household of faith. Ephesians gives us another good example of how we ought to conduct ourselves in verses chapter 2, verse 19 to 22. Now, therefore, he says, you are no longer strangers and foreigners. Amen? We are what? Brothers and sisters in Christ. When you have Jesus in common, you have all things in common. But fellow citizens with the saints and members of, again, there's that word, household of God. I was talking to a lady after service and she was encouraged. She was saying, you know, when you're talking about the household of God, it reminded me, of, I had a family member out in a different part of the state of California, way up north, and she had an issue going on. She was unsaved and I called the church up there and the church responded. A year later, after things aspired, uh, tra uh, transpired, they ended up, her and her husband, uh, ended up going to that church, getting saved, changing their life, and they've been serving there ever since. And so uh, you see, you know, just the, the, the body of Christ. 
And yet we see here a great picture of how we ought to conduct ourselves in the house of God. He says, going on, reading on, he says, So that we're fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being what? The chief cornerstone in whom the whole body is fitted together, growing into a what? Holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for the dwelling place of God in the spirit. And I love this because, you know, it talks about here, you know, Jesus is a cornerstone. You've got to keep him, you know, our, you know, our cornerstone. And you, all, you builders know, you got to have that focal point. You, you always go back to when you're building. Why? Because if you don't go back to your focal point or that cornerstone, you, you can end off, you can end up building a patio and you can end up totally, just totally uh, array. But I like this because it talks about the whole body yet being fitted together grows in, holy, in the holy temple of the Lord. You know, when you fit things together, when you're doing pavers or when, you, when you're fitting things together, especially when you're talking about the cornerstone or blocks or anything like that, right? What do you do? There's friction there. You got you got to hammer it in place. You got to get it right in spot. There's going to be friction there, and everything has to be snug together. And guess what? Sometimes when you when you when you when you rub elbows, don't you? There's going to be a little friction. And when you have friction, there's going to be a little bit of sparks, right? So sparks go flying. We're living stones, and we rub up against each other sometimes. But the Bible says that iron sharpens iron. Are we going to always uh, agree on some things? Maybe not. Maybe on the non-essentials we shouldn't. The essentials we should. Are we going to rub up against each other sometimes? Because maybe you had a bad day and you came to church and before you got in to get service, uh, you got approached the wrong way or something happened and you just kind of blew up. It happens. Maybe it's just that time where everything is going wrong. You just, you just made it in the door and there, you just let it out. We need to understand that. People go through things and it comes out and we're going to see it in the worst way. It's like going to an emergency room and not expecting to see blood. You're going to see some, some open wounds. You're going to see some people cut up. You're going to see some stuff that may cause you to go to the bathroom and call Ralph. And that's the way it is. But, but at the same time, listen guys, it, it says grows into a holy temple of God. What does that mean? He that begins a good work in you is faithful to complete it. I want to encourage you guys, give your brothers and sisters opportunity to grow. Amen? We have a variety of, of, of individuals here that come from a variety of different backgrounds. We have some people that have been in church all their life. We have some people that are new to church. And what happens a lot of times is we have more mature Christians and and we look at certain things that are taking place and we expect them to be at our level. We got to give them time to grow. Listen, when you, when you look at our church and you, and you line it up with other churches, listen, you got you to give us time to grow. A amen? It's just part of what we got to do. That's, that's what it says. Grows into a holy temple of the Lord. Amen? We should be a better church this year than we were at the beginning of the church. You should be more stronger in your walk this year than you were at the beginning of last year. Why? Because you've been growing. Why? Because you've been reading your Bible. You've been coming to church. You've been fellowshipping. You've been plugging in to the vine. And it says, in whom also you are being built together a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. we, we got to give the Lord that opportunity to, to grow us in our faith. Amen? And we got to be graceful with one another in that. Not everybody is in the same place that we are. And that's where grace comes in. That's where, you know, uh, encouragement comes in. That's where all those things come in. And the reality is, I put the expectations, and not only I, but the Bible puts the expectations, the greater expectations, on the more mature believers. We have a greater responsibility to bring ourselves down to these new believers' level and to encourage them, to meet them where they're at. To pour into their lives, to disciple them. You know, the Bible says, older women, what? Pour into your younger women. Same thing with the older men, born to your younger men. We got individuals that don't want to deal with younger men. We don't want to see teenagers doing this. We don't want to see teenagers, you know, in, in men's Bible studies. We don't want this and we don't want that. Got to be very careful. Got to be very careful. This is God's church. It's not your church. It's not my church. I'm very blessed when you see these young kids doing this. Why? Because you go to a lot of other churches and you won't see young... You won't even see a youth ministry. Why? Because they've said, you know what? The sanctuary is not for you. 
You're not old enough yet. And guess what? By the time they get to be an adult, they don't want to come to the big church. Why? Because they're afraid of it. And guess what? We'll just, we won't even go to church. You've got to be very, very careful. Remember, these young people are the next generation. They're the ones that are going to be carrying the gospel into this next generation. And we need all the young people we can get. So when we call this youth takeover, amen. Take over the church, youth, amen. Why? Because they have the energy. <laughs> they got the energy, right? And you know what? I'm very blessed and proud of our youth uh, to see their fire and zeal for God. You know, we just got, I got an email from the, the, the city of Fontana, the, over, the director of all the junior high schools. She says, I just got an email regarding the impact and what you guys are doing uh, in Fontana. She says, when can we get some of that? When can you bring this into our junior highs, high schools? All of them in Fontana. We, we want that. And what is that? that? We want the gospel in our junior high schools. That's what she's saying. I just got this last night. I'm going like, praise the Lord. Amen. It's time. It's time. When you think about Calvary Chapel, I mean, it was built off teenagers. It was built off young adults. I mean, Greg Laurie was a teenager one time. <laughs> right? Pastor Dave was a teenager one time. And that's where the Lord met them. I mean, you read the book Harvest. I mean, they were just young teenagers looking for somewhere to go and feel accepted. And we got thousands of them in Fontana that really don't have that place. But they'll go to the Internet. They'll get occupied in the Internet. And the Internet will, the internet will pollute their minds. But you know what? We need to be open. We need to be open to that. And that's the vision that God has given to us, is to, to really look at them and to consider them as, as, as a part of his plan. His reality is they're going to be adults here quick. But we see here that the Bible says that you are a member of God's family, and the reality is it's not an option. Every Christian needs to be a part of the church family. A Christian without a church family is like a person who says, I want to be in the army, but not serve in, in any platoon. There's no such thing to, as a Christian to be the Lone Ranger. It's like, it's like when you're out barbecuing and you have your coals, right? And they're all on fire, but if you take one of those coals and you put it to the side, what's going to happen to that coal? Is it's going to burn out. You need to, to make a commitment. You need to plug in. You need to you know, become part of the body. Some of you know what I'm talking about. You know, throughout the year, you've kind of hit and miss church, and you can sense that, that de decrease in your spiritual walk. Why? Because you can't give what you don't have. And when you come to church, really, we pour into your lives. So, because the world will take from you, and you pour out. And so, we all need, again, to be a part of something. Without a church family, you know, I hear people say, well, I don't need to go to church. Well, you, you know, the reality is, I mean, it's like you want to play an instrument, but not want to be a part of the orchestra. Everybody has a part to play. You need to pick up tennis. I mean, that's the reality. The fact is we need each other to be strong in our Christian faith. You know, when you are saved, you become part of what is called the universal church. What do you mean? That's general for, again, universal church that is comprised of all believers in Jesus Christ who are, whoever lived throughout the world right now, there's services going on all over the world. There's services, people being impacted in all kinds of different countries. And just like when you were born, you were born into a, the human race. When you were born, you were born into a family. Amen. And when you are born again, you are born into a church family. A church family. And there are over 30 commands in Scripture that you can't uh, obey unless you're a part of a church community. This, is ob this obviously again means a lot of things. It means that diversity is healthy. Diversity is healthy. And I love the fact that we have a diverse church. We get to experience multiple different cultures, uh, multiple different foods. And it's just really neat to see it all come together. And it's like, wow. Whether it's, you know, white collar, blue collar, you know, low end, whatever it is. I mean, it's amazing to see. Everybody has something to offer. It means that we need to get together for more than just a sermon on Sunday. As family, we need community. We need to be a community and we need to support each other. It means that we support each other when needed. It means that we exercise discipline as necessary. And it means that we aren't just an organization. We are a familia. Right? Did I say that? Did I say that right? 
So that's the first thing that we see here, is that as a church, we are a family. And second, we see here the term that Paul uses is also found in verse 15. It says, going back to 1 Timothy, But if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is what? The church of the living God. Our God is alive. Our God is not dead. Our God is alive. We serve a living, true God. Buddha's dead. Muhammad's dead. Confucius is dead. They're all dead. Our God is alive and powerful, omnipotent. He's the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the end, the Lion, the Lamb. We see here that this emphasizes here on the character of the church. The fact that we are the church of the living God by its very nature belongs to the living God. And in that, we see a great example in Acts chapter 20, verse 28. We have that verse up. Therefore, take heed to yourself and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. You see, Paul called the church in Ephesus God's own possession. God's own possession. How did he purchase it? With his own blood. With his own blood. To the praise of his glory. Timothy was leading the church of Ephesus. One that was located in the center of pagan worship. Remember the environment that it was in. It was a place where there were a, 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 basically assemblies of dead idols all around. What a difference to be a part of a church of the living God. Amen. You see, you see the, the, the difference. And here as we, we move on, we see that... The third term he uses, going back to 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, is that we are pillars and the ground of the truth. So not only are we the church of the living God, but we are what? The pillars and the ground of the truth. You see, the temple, as, as Paul's writing this letter, and thinking about this temple here that Timothy, I'm sure, sees every day, this, the temple, it was, it was to the goddess Diana. It was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world back then. And it was located right there in Ephesus. It had 127 pillars. Think about that. 127 pillars around each. And give, it was a, each one was a gift of a king. And all of them were made of marble. And some were made of a stubble with jewels and overlaid with gold. I mean, the function of the pillar was not to, to just decorate and look pretty, but it was to hold up the immense roof of the temple. That's what the pillars were for. What does Paul say here as he's talking about the pillars and talking about the, the ground of the truth? Well, here Paul says that the church, are we the church? Amen. Amen. We are what? To be the pillars which support or hold up God's truth. God's truth. We are to be the pillar. The people are supposed to declare the word of God that it is our authority. Without holding the Bible, a church is no longer, or teaching the Bible, or upholding the Bible, a church is no longer a pillar of truth, or a pillar of the church. Notice what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Verses 9 through 11. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. According to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation in another what? Builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it, for no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Amen. Every church, he is saying, is responsible to support and to hold up the teachings that has been delivered to us 
Every single church, every church is to be strong. Is to be a strong protection of what? Of the gospel. Of the word of God. Against the assaults of false teachers. Doctrines. The word of God isn't very popular these days. But it's what we're called to defend. It's what we're called to come alongside and to lift up. We see another great example in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1 and 2. It says, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, in which you stand, by which also you were saved. Amen. I love that. You see, guys, that's the reality. The only thing that we have, and I say the only thing, I mean, I mean, praise God, <laughs> the only thing we have to offer you guys is the Word of God. That's all we can do is prepare the meal. You have to feed yourself. We can't force feed you. I cannot go home with you and, and tell your husband to do certain things or, your, or we can't, you know, your wife or whatever it may be. We can offer the gospel. That's really all we're here to do. That's all we're here to do is teach the word. Teach the word simply, teach the word. Let the word of God through the power of the Holy Spirit transforms lives, amen? We don't transform anybody. We don't save anybody. It's the gospel is the power to salvation. Amen. And that's why Paul is saying here, listen, Corinthian church, my brethren, I declare to you the gospel. Man, that's the most precious gift. It's the good news. Man, you know, it's not all that I have to offer, but man, I'm offering you something that is going to give you eternal life. He says, I have the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, in which you stand, by which also you were saved. If you hold fast the word which I preach to you, unless you believe in vain. <laughs> Hold fast, guys. That's what he's saying. We, we've preached it. We've taught it. You've received it. You've ingested it. You stand upon it. And it saved you. Now hold fast to it. Hold fast to it. Hold on to it. You've got to constantly be seeking, seeking the Lord out through his word. Unless, he says, you look back at your life and you find yourself so far from God that it says that you believed in vain. Why? Because again, like that coal, once you take yourself out of fellowship, once you take yourself away from the church, you take yourself away from the word, away from prayer, away from seeking him, you will what? You will be cold. You will be cold. Here, this is the main purpose of the church, to continue to teach the doctrine the apostles were given by Christ. And we see here in 2 Timothy chapter 3, turn there with me, verse 16 and 17, and I would again encourage you to write these verses down. But, but you know, Pastor Dan, men write the Bible. Men write the Bible. I, I, I have a trouble with that. It's all been written by men, and men are sinners. Well, the Bible tells me, well, let me ask you a question. Is there, is there an error? Is there any error in the Bible? No. Is, 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 does the Bible contradict itself? No. But have you heard those things before? But the Bible contradicts itself. There's, there's error in the Bible. Well, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, the Bible says all Scripture, all y'all Scripture, is given by what? The inspiration of God. And is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction, in righteousness. So, so when I step out in my flesh, and I try to you know, bring those things in my own flesh, i got to be very careful. Why? Because I'm getting in the way. Why? Because the reality is, if we read through the Bible, this is why in the Calvary movement has been so effective. Why? Because if you read through the Bible, the Bible will go ahead and do the work in your husband. The Word of God, the power of the Holy Spirit, will do the work in your wife, your teenager. You see that? I, I don't need to hit you up at the door. I don't need to, you know, follow you home and point out everything wrong in your life. No, the Bible says all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof. Another word for reproof is what? For correction, for instruction in righteousness. Read this together, guys. That the man of God may be what? Complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. See, so I'd rather spend my time 
give, teaching you the Bible, letting God meet you where you're at. Letting God teach you why, because he's the one that wants to equip you. He's the one that's what, uh, as the Bible says, he that begins a good work is you is faithful to complete. He's the one working on your life. So what is the truth we're called to safeguard? What should we major in? What should be our focus? Well, as we look at those three key attributes of the church, what the church should be, the pillars in the ground, holding up the gospel, taking the gospel out, not losing sight of what our mission is, because we can. Because a lot of churches, they can. Because we get so comfortable in here. And we forget about what's going on out there. He says right here in verse 16, and I love this, we see it's a hymn that contains really the gospel in a nutshell. Looking back at 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, so without controversy, great is what the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in glory. It's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. But we see this as a hymn. It contains six truths about Jesus Christ that I want us to see. You notice here in verse 16 that what is about, he's about to, uh, what he said, he said is that it is without what? That it's without controversy. Without what? Another word for controversy is question. It's without controversy, it's without question. Great is the mystery of godliness. In other words, it's the united agreement of believers that these things are true. They're beyond dispute. What do you mean? Hey, listen, we can disagree. We all may have a home to live in, but I can go to your home and I guarantee you it's not decorated the same as my home. You probably, your car is probably different than my car. You, you do things differently. Why? We're different. That's what makes us unique. I love that. That we're not all the same. We're not robots. Right? I mean, he could have made us robots and we could all be doing the same thing. Could you imagine if all you guys were up here preaching? We're all preaching together. <laughs> One time, you guys were all doing the same thing. It'd be crazy. I would, I'd probably get silly and be like, why, MC? <laughs> but the reality is this. We may not agree on the same paint color, but we should agree when it comes to the essentials of the Word of God. And, it, and the reality is, even though we, we rub up against each other, right, like living stones and there's friction, the reality is the Word of God, the truth of the Word of God should what? Refocus us to what our priority is in being here. Amen? Why we're here. Why are we here? Why are we the church? What are we called to do? And sometimes we need to be refocused. We need to kind of get set back on track. And, and, and we should be able to read the Word of God together, to pray together, and it should bring us back into God's will and the center of, 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 of God's uh, will for our lives. And, and so, so we see here that it's, it's beyond dispute. And it's called here, he says, the mystery of godliness. What does that mean? A mystery isn't something that is all uh, mysterious or uh, mystical. It really means it's something that was hidden and has now been revealed. That's what it means. And Jesus is the true revelation of godliness. And he has been revealed to us. And we have the better part, I believe. Amen? As you look at the Old Testament pointing towards Jesus, right? We get to look back at what he did for us. And we get to, every single one of us get to have the Holy Spirit. Versus in the Old Testament, God only gave his spirit maybe to a king. Or a member of King David where he says what? That you won't take your spirit away from me. Remember Saul had the spirit and God took the spirit and gave it to King David. See, now we all got God in us as believers. Every single one of us have the Lord living inside of us. So what is at the center of our faith? Well, let's look at the six things here. First of all, we see that Jesus appeared in the flesh. Jesus was manifested in the flesh. What do you mean? God became a man in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. You can go today to Bethlehem and you can find, you can visit, and you can see the birthplace where Jesus Christ was, was born. You can actually go and, and, and find a location where Jesus Christ was born. What do, you, what do you mean? Well, many cults, again, would, would in uh, world religions, would challenge the fact, the faith of this very point. They would say, no, Jesus, God didn't come down in the form of a man. Well, 
2 John answers that for us in 2 John chapter 1, verse 7. The Bible tells us, For many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus as coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. You see, but what is a remarkable fact is that if you think about God left heaven, <laughs> who would ever leave heaven? Right? I mean, once, you're, once I'm there, you know, don't pray me back. That's what Chuck said, right? Don't pray me back. <laughs> I'll come after you. But when you think about the priesthood of Christ, that he is the living, eternal God, yet in human flesh, walked in this earth, was an example for us. And yet, second here, we see, as we look further down, we go to the next one, that Jesus Christ was justified in the Spirit. He was justified in the Spirit. What does that mean? Well, it could refer to the fact that the Holy Spirit vindicated him as the sinless Son of God, meaning that the Spirit said he is for real. He is the Son of God. How? By the resurrection, by resurrecting him. The ultimate vindication of Jesus took place when he was raised from the dead. We see a great example of this in Matthew chapter 3, verse 17 also, as the voice from heaven said, this is my what? This is my Son, whom I love with whom I am well pleased. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, calls him, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. Hebrews chapter 7, and you can write these ones down, describe him as holy, describe him as innocent, describe him as undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the nations. Although he was fully man, what made him awesome, what made him unique, was that he was sinless, and that he was perfect. So we see that he was justified in the spirit. We see here, thirdly, that Jesus was seen by angels. He was seen by angels. What do you mean? Well, throughout his ministry, angels ministered to him. We see an example in Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, verse 26 to 28. It says, Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to the city of Galilee, named Nazareth, to the virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David. The virgin, named, her name was Mary. And having come to him, the angel said to her, Rejoice! Highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. And you can see a whole dialogue that she has with the angel in verse 34. Then Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I do not know him? And the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. And so they announced, the angels announced his birth. They ministered to him during his temptation. They strengthened him in the Garden of Gethsemane. They observed him during the, his death and resurrection. And the angels, right on Easter, right, what did we learn? The angels, what, rolled away the stone. They were of lightning, right, hanging out. Everybody was freaked out because they saw the angel. They rolled away the stone of the door of the tomb, and they announced, they announced his ascension. Angels were involved with his ministry from beginning to end. And the statement could have even in mind the worship given to the ascended Christ in heaven. And so we see here, again, the third thing is that Jesus was seen by angels. And fourth, we see that Jesus was preached among the Gentiles. Do we have any Jewish people in the house? All right. Awesome. Praise the Lord. How many Gentiles do we have, though? Everybody else, right? And so Jesus commissioned us to preach to the entire world that is taking place right now. The gospel being preached. This is our mandate. As many of us here are what? 
We've heard the message of the gospel. We are Gentiles. We have been received. Jesus was preached among the Gentile, continues to be preached amongst the Gentile. And fifthly here, we see that, we see here, uh, he was believed on in the world. Believed on in the world. And again, at the first public preaching after the resurrection, 3,000 people were saved, right? Peter, the, 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 the guy was, was, that rejected him three times, they're up in the upper room. The Holy Spirit falls upon them. So you see Peter before the Holy Spirit, rejecting Christ three times. You see Peter with the Holy Spirit, empowered by the Holy Spirit. Goes out there. People think he's drunk. He gives one, they would say, commentators say, about four minute message. Four minutes. I couldn't even get my testimony in four minutes. In school of ministry, they give you five minutes to do your testimony. It's like so fast. In four minutes, Peter gave a message. 3,000 people were saved. 3,000 people. And that's where the church began. And in the day that followed, how many more? Thousands more believed that the gospel is spreading. And even today, we can see that even right now, you know, the gospel is being taught all over the world. Think about that. People are getting saved today. People are going to get saved in this room today. People are going to get added to church family today. Amen? I'm excited about that. The last, one, the last thing that we see here was that he was taken up in glory. He was taken up in glory. And what does this show? This shows that God was satisfied with his work. On the cross, he said, Tetalistai. What does that mean? It is finished. And then his spirit, right, was lifted up in his glory. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. The Bible says, Who being in the brightness of his glory... And the express image of his person. And upholding all things by the word of his power. When he had by himself purged our sins. Sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So what do we see here? Well really this is the gospel message in a nutshell. What do you mean? What is, what is that? God became what? Man. Died for our sins. Triumphed over Death and was honored by angels and feared by demons and ascended into heaven. So this message has been preached all over the world. And many have believed and many have been saved. Amen. Have you. And you know who you are. If you've never received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. You've never accepted him to be your God. Because you have a choice to make. Why? Because God can't force himself. Again, just like I said earlier, we, we can only prepare the meal. You got to feed yourself. You got to take it. John 3, 16, for God what? So love the world. He gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. When you think about this message that has been preached all over the world, when you think about what he says here in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, but God demonstrated his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. But, but pastor, you don't even know what I've, what I've done. I barely made it in the church. I was afraid it was going to burn down. There is no sin that is too powerful that God can't forgive. No sin. Only one, and that's not receiving Him. That's not acknowledging Him as Lord and Savior. That's not believing in Him. That's really, that's it. Blaspheming the Holy Spirit. And that's your choice. Everything else, God can forgive you from. And I know that some of us carry a heavy load. God raises the living and the dead. God can remove your sins from you right now. While you were yet a sinner, he already took care of it. He that knew no sin became a sin offering for you. That's why he had to come. That's why he sent his only begotten son. That's why he sent his most precious gift. And that's why we see here in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2, verse 9, the Bible says, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, 
a holy nation, his own special people, that you may what? Proclaim the praises of him who called you. So, yes, it's, it's an honor to come to a place and to get the word of God and to get taught, but we got to be proclaiming the word. Amen. So not only receiving the word, ingesting it, but also allowing, you know, that Holy Spirit to work through our life, to explode through our life, to proclaim his word. Amen. And I love this because that's what the church is. Chosen generation, guys. We're the next generation. Do you know that? We are the next generation. Believe it or not, whether you believe so or not, you come to this church, we are the next generation. We are, third, uh, we are the third generation of Calvary Chapel. So it'd be, like, it'd be like you're the father, then you have your son, then you have a grandson. That's us. We're a third generation. Why would God call us to take it into the next generation? So yes, we do have a young vision here for, a young, for young people to see a, a fresh movement. But that's not, my, that's not my, that's God's vision. That's why God has called us. We are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. Never forget this, brothers and sisters. A holy nation. You are his own special people. In spite of everybody else, the way they treat you, in spite of, uh, you know, in spite of the way you may have been raised or what family you were brought up in, and you may have never felt special in your life. Listen, you are special to God. Amen? And sometimes you may not be treated that way at home, but you are special to God, and you need to know that. That you may proclaim the praise of Him who called you out of darkness and into His marvelous light. Never forget where we come from. Huh? Never forget where we come from. It's like, it's like that beggar that gets, you know, that hits the lottery and then he hits the lottery and then he doesn't help anybody when he's been getting helped all along. And, you know, God, and, and he got blessed and then he didn't want to bless others. Guys, that can happen, huh? You know, we get saved. We get picked up out of the trash. You know, our life was a mess. We were a wreck. God saves us. You know, our life is good. God is good. You know, finances are there. Everything's good. And then we look at everybody else and they're beneath us. And, and, and we start to judge them. We start to pick on them. And we start to, you know, act like we're better than them. Listen, we're only, we're only you know, one job away from being back in the dumps. We're only, you know, one bad decision, you know, uh, one phone call away from our life changing. None of us are better than anybody else. Amen? We need to remember that. I don't care how long you've been saved. I don't care what church you used to go to. God shows no partiality. We are all his chosen people. Royal priesthood. Could you imagine? Royal priesthood. A holy nation. His own special people. That God has taken us from darkness into marvelous light. And I think maybe... We need to think back to where God found us. Because a lot of us have been blessed. You know, I was sitting around my, my home with my kids, my wife. That, you know, the, the, the house God gave us, just God has blessed us. Why? He didn't have to. He, he chose to. And we had an opportunity to say, thank you, Lord. We had an opportunity to to just get on our knees and just thank him for every good and perfect gift. For the things, even for the unanswered prayer, I was talking to a gentleman the other day and he says, hey, I don't know where we got into this conversation, but he says, here, let me show you a picture. <laughs> he says, when I was younger, and this was BC days, he goes, this girl was hot. He goes, but look at her now. <laughs> I'm like, dude, really? He goes, thank God for unanswered prayers. <laughs> I said, hey man, it works both ways, right? <laughs> But that's the reality, right? I mean, thank God for even the things that we prayed for that he didn't answer because he knew he knows what's best for us. Amen. And the good thing about the Lord and what I appreciate about the Lord, even when he looks at our church, you know, we have both sides of our church. In some areas, we're well organized. In some areas, we do things well. But in some areas, we're not as organized as we should be. But you know what I like about the Lord is that he sees what we're going to become. Amen. He don't, he don't see where we are. He sees where we're going to end up. And that's more important to me. Amen. That he that begins a good work is faithful to complete it. And when I look at you guys, and I know that, that again, you struggle with various things, uh, you know, we, we come with the same type of grace. 
you know, we, we, we want to give God that opportunity to, to do in your life what he's doing in our life. And we got to give an opportunity. Amen? We can't just look at everybody and think, well, you know, they should be here. Well, yeah, but listen, we're going to mature. Okay, but that's part of what maturing is. You mature. You grow. And how do we grow? We grow through fellowship. We grow through the word of God. We, go through, we grow through prayer. We, we grow through going through things together. Amen? And we go through, you know, things that, that we, you know, as family, that's what we do. We grow. And that's what we're doing, I believe. And as you hang on, and as you hold on, you hold on to Christ, we will continue to what? To grow. As long as you stay in the center of that, you know, coal where the fire is lit, we can continue to keep each other on fire. The minute we start isolating ourselves, the minute we start, you know, going here and going there, and we start separating ourselves from the body of Christ, be careful, because you will get cold. You, you know, and, and if you don't have fellowship, you need to be praying, you need to be reading your word, and you need to be um, sharing your faith, exercising as much of those spiritual vitamins as possible. And so what I want to do right now is, you may be here and you may say, you know, one of the things that really uh, turned me on to Jesus was family. Well, one, having a relationship with him and having my sins forgiven, but also with family. Bless you. I didn't have family. Now I have family. And that's one of the things that, you know, the church, you know, the brotherhood. I never had brothers. I, I love having the brothers I have in the world. And you know what? You may be, you know, you may be in that same situation. You may say, you know what, it's the holidays, I don't have family, or maybe you do, but you guys are just not really having fellowship right now. Hey, listen, you know, God wants you in his family. He wants you so much in his family that he died for you to be in his family. That's how valuable you are. So what we're going to do right now is we're going to have the worship team come up. We want to give you an opportunity. We're going to pray. And if you want to be in God's family, you've got to make that choice. And how? Well, believe. Have faith. We're going to say a prayer. You've got to confess. You've got to let him, though, be the leader of the family. Right? You've got to let him lead your life. One of the things that I had to do was I had to give him the keys to my car. I had to give the keys to my heart. I had to give the keys to my soul. Amen? You have to let Jesus take the will. And sometimes that's hard. Why? Because we have our will, and that will is the flesh. And we have to die to that right now. And we have to give God and let, let Him lead by the Spirit. And so, if you want to come into God's family today, we want to welcome you. We want to pray for you. If you want to you know, have a relationship with Jesus Christ, if you want Him to re forgive you of all your sins, if you want to have heaven for all eternity, we want to give you that opportunity right now. Amen? Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the church that you gave us. Father, we thank you for the word, Lord, because, Father, that's what we're here to do, is to spread the gospel, to share the good news, Father. To take that out, Lord, that others may hear, even as we learn today. We are taking that gospel out, even today. We are preaching Jesus today. The eyes closed and our heads bowed. You want to come into the family of God. We want to welcome you with open arms. He wants to welcome you with open arms. First thing you must do is realize you're a sinner. Second thing you must do is recognize that Jesus Christ died on the cross to save sinners. Third, repent. Change the direction of your life. You've got to give up some of those things that are preventing you from hearing from God, from truly allowing God to lead your life. And fourth, he gives you eternal life. He wants to give you a gift right now. It's up to you to receive it or not. You give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that tells me that 
It says, Jesus stands at the door of your heart and he knocks. And if you open it, he will come in. And what you feel right now, that tug, that knocking on your heart, that's, that's the Lord. That's the Spirit. That's the power. That's God. Right now, God knocking at the door of your heart. Are you going to open it or not? That's between you and God. I would encourage you, open it. He says he'll come in. He'll change your life. He'll fill you, that void. See, there's a void. And, and, and we're all born with that. That God holds shape back to me. We want to fill it with all kinds of things. Commercialism. All, all kinds of things. And, and I tell you what, you'll never be satisfied until you fill it with Jesus. And so we're going to finish this song. And if you feel that knocking, I would encourage you to, to open it up. And we're going to pray. And, and you can leave knowing that you are right with the Lord. give life, you are love, you will bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken, great are you. stand up right where you're at. To stand up. By you standing up is, is by you opening that door of your heart to Him today. The Bible says that if you confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father in Heaven. But if you deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father in Heaven. You know, when Jesus Christ died on the cross, He didn't do it behind closed doors. He did it out publicly where everyone could see. And so today what you're doing is you're saying, you know, Lord, I want to take a stand for you. I want you to be my God. And in that, I'm going to stand for you. I'm going to show it. I'm going to proclaim it. Anybody else? Anybody else? And maybe you you have done this before, but yet, like that coal, you've kind of removed yourself from God, and you've kind of found yourself kind of out there, away from God. You've taken a thousand steps away from God, but listen, you can take one step back to Him today. And it may not be that, that He's going to you know, give you salvation again, but He'll restore you back into that fellowship, back into the family. And if that's you today, I would ask that you would even stand. You would even stand. You would say... You know what, Lord, I'm going to stand for you. Lord, I've been kind of running. I've been kind of doing my own thing. But Lord, you know, I'm tired of it. It's, it's taking its toll on my life. And you know, I'm, going to, I'm going to make that commitment. You know, like the good old days when I was walking, I was fervent, I was on fire. But today is a day of salvation. Today is a good day in Christ Jesus before we pray. Just stand right where you're at. The Holy Spirit is knocking on your heart. Acknowledge Him. That's God trying to get your attention. It's God. He wants you and Him to make amends today before we close. Amen. Again, he's going to do the work. He's going to, you know, to, to get you to that place where he wants you to be. Don't worry about your life. Don't try to clean yourself up first and then come to Christ. No, you come as you are. And he's going to do the work. And we're going to grow together. Amen. Father, you see those that are standing. Lord, I ask even now in the name of Jesus Christ that you would just touch them right where they're at, Lord. Every single heart, every single soul. Lord, and as we just read, that chosen generation, Lord, the royal priesthood, Lord. Father, they're a part of that. You, these are special to you, Lord. And we thank you for allowing us to be a part of this here this morning. And for you that are standing, I would encourage you just to say this prayer after me. Is it the prayer that saves you? No, it's your faith. Whosoever believes, it's your belief that will make you well. So I would just, again, I'm leading you into prayer, and I would ask that you repeat after me. Before we pray, if there's anybody else, you can stand. Don't leave with any regrets. Tomorrow's not promised to no man. We don't know. All right. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. It's okay. Repeat after me. Dear Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sins. Wash me. Cleanse me. Give me a new life. Empower me with the Holy Spirit. 
and help me to follow you from this day forward. Help me to trust you from this day forward. Restore my broken heart. Father, thank you for dying on the cross for me. And thank you for rising from the dead for me. I'm giving you my soul. I'm giving you the keys to my life, to my heart. Be my God, be my Lord, and be my Savior. In Jesus' holy name we pray, and all God's children said, amen. 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 Keep standing, guys. Keep standing. Amen, guys. Praise the Lord. Why do we ask you to stand? Why? Because you know why? Your brothers and sisters need to see why so they can pray for you. Amen? Amen? Not judge you. Pray for you. Amen? Let's give the Lord a hand. Amen? God is good. I want to go ahead and encourage you guys understanding. Read your word. Okay? Read your word. Pray. You don't need, you know, it's not like cell phone or Wi-Fi. You got to pay for it. It's free. Unlimited. God wants to hear from you. He's never too far. He's never too busy for you. Your matter, your, your issues, your concerns are important to Him. Amen? They're important to God. Cry out to Him. And then three, fellowship. Plug in. If you're youth, go to our youth group on Thursday. Get to meet some of the youth. We have great youth here for adults. We have couple studies coming up. We have men's. We have women's. There's a lot of things you can do to mature, to plug into the vine. And lastly, go share today with somebody what God just did in your life. Amen? Let me pray. Father, we thank you for this church. We thank you for the work you did today. Lord, we ask that you will glorify yourself continuously through our life. Put your warring angels around us. Protect us. Guard us. Provide for us. And Lord, that we would Lord, continue to glorify you and praise your holy name because you are worthy and you are an awesome God. In the name of Jesus, we pray. All God's children said, amen. 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 God bless you guys.